us to Ephesians chapter number 5, the book of Ephesians in chapter number 5 tonight. We will conclude, <coughs> excuse me, our series that we've been trying to get back to now for about two or three weeks on the subject of the home, one of war's greatest casualties. Um, in our previous messages, We've given to you the premise that has been our thought behind these series of messages, which is that one of the unseen casualties of literal warfare, uh, every time it seemed like that I would read a book about military history, especially from around World War I and forward, not so much the Civil War, Revolutionary War, but from about the turn of the century, the 20th century, when we started in World War I and started going forward into World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan, and all the way up to now, there was a theme that kept reoccurring either when I would read a biography of one individual, or whether I was reading an over, overwhelming scope of an entire war scene, one thing kept coming up, and it was this, one of the unseen casualties that kind of went unnoticed. Obviously, we, we check out the body toll on the battlefield, how many men die, and that's about all that we look at. What started catching my mind, Brother Keith, was that the unseen, unknown casualty of war was the home. Seemed like so many homes and marriages just did not make it through the stress, the strain, and even the time separation between the husband and wife that caused so much pressure on these homes. The last time I preached to you on this subject, we saw that even chaplains, when the war against terror started in Afghanistan, said they were facing an epidemic. They'd never seen anything like this with how many homes were busting up because of the pressure that the war had been putting on them. And so what hit my mind was in chapter 6 of Ephesians, right after Paul spends a good deal of chapter 5 exhorting about the home, the husband and wife relationship, he moves to chapter 6 and starts talking about warfare. Verses 10 in chapter 6 all the way through verse 17 deals with warfare. The fact is that we are facing a real enemy that wants to ruin your home tonight. The Bible said, we, we're, 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 you, you, let me just say this to you. As far as sheer numbers go, your marriage is outnumbered, sir. Your marriage is outnumbered, ma'am. Look, look what you're fighting against. Look at chapter 6, verse 11. Chapter 6, verse 11, he said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So the devil's against you. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. So there's these spiritual principalities that's against you. Against powers. So now you got three strikes. These powers in the world are against you. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world. So now you got four strikes against you. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. If I count right... You've got so many enemies entailed in those five things that you couldn't even number them all tonight if you tried. There's a lot that's against your home making it, sister. There's a lot against your home making it, brother. The world's against you. The devil's against you. The imps of hell is against you. And they are all concerted in one effort to try and ruin the spirituality and the direction of your home. But I am proud to report to you tonight that the Bible still rings true when it says, if God be for us, who can be against us? And the Bible is still true, Brother Jimmy, when it says we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And there are examples in the Bible of godly Christian men and women who loved God and loved each other and raised a family for God even in the midst of a decadent, wicked society that was totally against them. You can make it. Say, I don't think I'm going to. You can. Say, I don't think I'm going to do it. You, you can. You say, how do you know? Because God said you could tonight. 
And sister, if you've got a mind to do it God's way and make it, and brother, if you've got a mind to do it God's way and make it, then trust me, you're going to make it. I don't care how much opposition's against you. So this is the thought behind what we've been dealing with. We have gone before our text tonight, and we looked at the defense of the home in our first installment. We found that in chapter 6, verses 10 to 17. We have gone uh, behind our text tonight, and we've looked at the duties of the home. We found that in chapter 5, verses 14 to 21, and all of those duties that go into making a home a happy one, a godly one, a successful one. But tonight, this is the meat of the text of where we're really getting at and where I've been shooting at through these three series of messages. And tonight, we're going to read from chapter 5, verse 22, down to the end of the chapter, verse 33. And I would like to preach tonight not on the defense or the duties of the home, but I would like to conclude this series on the downfalls of the home. So many homes fall down. So many homes don't make it. Why? What are the downfalls of the home? I would like to point some of them out to you tonight. Hope to be in her encouragement and helping the blessing to you. Ephesians 5 verse 22, if you're with me tonight, say amen. amen. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ... So let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, uh, uh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. Now, if a man the caliber of Paul says marriage is a great mystery, (laughs) y'all, it's a great mystery. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. Boy, that would solve a lot of problems right there, wouldn't it? I think one of the biggest downfalls in marriage, this ain't even my message tonight. Doesn't even in my notes, but let me just say this because I feel like the Lord gave me a nudge right here to say it. I think one of the biggest downfalls in marriage is selfishness. Just plain old rotten selfishness. In the text it said, if you want to make it, then sir, you have to love your wife even as you love yourself. Do you know who loves Cody Zorn the most in his life? (laughs) Cody Zorn. Yeah. And you know who loves you the most in your life? You. You. You know who your biggest fan is, sir? You know who your biggest fan is, ma'am? That person who you look in the mirror. You love you. Say, so, oh, I, I, no, yeah, yeah, you do. Because you, you pamper you. You buy for you. You cater to you. You say what you want to say. Think what you want to think. Look at what you want to look at. Do what you want to do. You love you. I'm talking about me. I love me. I tell you what helped my home out. Let me just tell you what would help my home out more in the coming days ahead. If I love that woman as much as I love me. Sister, you know what would help your home out? If you loved him as much as you love you. I mean, that ain't popular, but that's Bible. Selfishness kills marriages. No thought for the other person that's in this marriage together. No thought for what they like. No thought for what they don't like. No thought for what hurts them or what doesn't hurt them. No thought for their life. No thought for their well-being. No thought whatsoever for them. Yeah, get ready for a real rough time in your life. 
So let the, his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. The downfalls of the home. I believe in these verses we find why many Christian homes, and that's what I'm preaching to. Y'all, I want you to understand something. I'm not preaching to lost homes in this series. If, 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 the, if first base ain't right, which is both of you are saved and born again, then, then, then we're already off to a wrong start. What I'm preaching to in this series of messages are two people who claim to be born again. Let me just say this. If both of you claim to be born again, there's no reason why two saved, born again children of God who are both trying to live according to the Bible can't make it in marriage. I don't believe that you can't. If both of you are filled with the Holy Ghost, both of you are sealed with the Holy Ghost, then you ought to be able to make it in this thing called marriage. More often than not, what happens is one or the other is either not saved or one or the other couldn't give a flip less about what the Bible says. So what are the downfalls of the home? We'll show you three things and we'll be done tonight and we'll conclude this series of thoughts. Number one, I see the first downfall in our text is misunderstood roles. Misunderstood roles in the home. What are the roles that the husband and the wife is supposed to fulfill in the home? Well, you saw it in the text. I read it to you in verses 22 through verse 33. It could not be any clearer than what I showed you. What are the roles that the husband and wife are pictured as? The husband is pictured as the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the body, the head of the church. And the wife is pictured as the church that has been called out, has been wooed to his side, and has been loved to himself. So if I understand what I've just told you and what the Bible says, is, then this is what that means. I am called to treat Tristan Zorn like Jesus treats me. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest with you. I ain't even going to try and lie to none of you tonight and act like I'm something I ain't. There's a whole lot of times in my life I don't treat her like Jesus treats me. And let's just be honest, sir. If you really started looking at the way you treat your wife, how would you like it if Jesus started treating you that way? Lord, thank you that you don't treat me like I've been treating my wife. Amen. Say amen or oh me, fellas. It ain't going to get no better from here, so we might as well all just get in on this thing together, all right? <laughs> and if I understand my Bible correctly, that woman is to treat me like the church is supposed to treat the Lord Jesus Christ. Sister, you are to treat that thing that you're married to... <laughs> It's your fault. You said I do. You to treat that thing you married to like the church is supposed to treat the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We all ought to shout and say, thank God that this church don't treat Jesus like some of y'all treat your husbands. He might have done wrote Ichabod over the doors and left us a long time ago. Now, I'm going to make a disclaimer before I deal with these misunderstood roles. Listen to what I'm fixing to tell you. None of this works. None. None of this works. All these roles that I'm fixing to talk about, the wife like the church, the husband like Christ, none of this works if neither one of you are submitted to the Word of God. Amen. This is my disclaimer tonight. Brother Garrett, none of this is going to work for our homes if me and my wife are not submitted to the word of God. Because y'all, let's just be honest. Let, I know, I know, I know he man, I know he man, you like, my God, my wife's gonna submit to me. <laughs> no, she don't have to. She, she, she can do what she wants. You can't make her do nothing she don't want to do. The fact is tonight, if my wife submits to me, honors me, and reverences me like the Bible tells her to, you know the only reason she does that? It ain't because I can make her. It's because she loves God and she loves the book. And she wants to be an obedient child of God. And sister, if your husband treats you like Jesus treats the church and loves you unconditionally and, and prays for you and provides for you and protects you and is good to you, you can't make him do that. It's only because he loves God and he loves his word. So none of this even works tonight if, if either one of you or both of you are going to be stiff-necked, hard-hearted, and say, I just don't care what the Bible says. I'm going to do what I want to do. So let's look at these roles. Let's, let's look at these roles. Firstly, we see the wife is supposed to treat 
her husband like the church treats Jesus. Y'all saw that, didn't you? The Bible said in verse number 22 that wives to submit themselves unto their own husbands as unto the Lord. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as. Remember we've been preaching that series on God as. Here's some more, uh, you know, illustrative material. Even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. You are to treat him like the church does Jesus. How do we treat Jesus at this church? We love him. We lift him up. We praise him. We follow him. We obey him. We don't criticize him. We don't contradict him. We don't act like we, we know more than he knows. We put him first. Amen. We make sure he has the preeminence in this place. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now I know what I'm talking about, and we're going to get to this in a minute. It totally defies 2022, but I couldn't give a flip less what 2022 thinks. Amen. I'm trying. I'm interested in what what does the Bible say about this thing. And according to the Bible, sister, you are to treat him like we all in the church are to treat Jesus Christ. We don't start walking around to people and saying, uh, you know. Let me tell you something about Jesus. He could do a lot better. You know, I'm just, I'm just going to tell you. I'm just about headed up to here with Jesus. You know, just ticks me off constantly. He gets on my nerves, aggravates me. You say, I would never say that about Jesus. Let's just pause and just preach a minute about Jesus. You do that by not obeying what he said. If you love me, you keep my commandments. You, you, you contradict him, you criticize him, and you go against him every time you don't do what he's asked you to do this evening. Ladies, as far as everyone in here is concerned, there should be absolutely no blemish in your husband. Just listen to me, sister. I mean, God bless you. Unless there's like some serious, you know, serious issues that need to be dealt with or something like that, and, and that even in a private setting with the pastor and his wife. Listen to what I'm fixing to tell you. They, they ain't, none of these ladies in the church needs to have you texting them, calling them, and telling them how sorry your husband is that you live with. They ain't, they ain't never calls or a place in this church for you to get two or three women off to the side and start lamp blasting your husband to them. That's a bad look. It is. It's terrible look. I was talking about this in Sunday school the other day. Uh, I was talking about this in Sunday school the other day. This is the roughest message in this series, so let's just take it together. I was talking about this in, in Sunday school the other day, and there's nothing more, there's nothing more repulsive to me or unattractive or just, just absolutely just, uh, just it grates me like somebody nails on a chalkboard than when I'm trying to talk to a man, either in this church or any other church, and I'm trying to talk to this man, and I ask him a question or something like that, and we're talking, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, his wife jumps in, no, that ain't the way it was no he don't know and he starts trying to tell me again and, no, no 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 that ain't that ain't it no no he's wrong what are you trying to do make him look stupid and make you look smart yeah. Come on, what, what are you trying to do like like no he's a dumb imbecile just i, I got this that don't make you look good sister as far as this church is concerned, all they need to know about y'all's relationship, unless there's something serious, like I say, going on that we'd have to deal with. I'm talking about just normal husband-wife stuff. They should think your husband is your he-man. Build him up. Praise him. Thank God for him. Lift him up. Don't tear him down. Why? That's how we're supposed to treat Jesus. We don't come in and badmouth the Lord. You know what we are to him? We're faithful to him. We're called to be faithful to him. I like what they said, what Peter said. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. We're not looking to leave you, Lord. We want to stay with you. Sister, hang with him. Hey, amen. Amen. I like, what the, I like what Solomon said. I found the one whom my soul loveth. I held him and would not let him go. 
So the misunderstood roles. The first role we see here is the wife supposed to act like the church. The second role that we see here is the husband is supposed to act like Jesus Christ. You are to treat that woman like Jesus treats you and I as the church. We see this in verse 25. As a matter of fact, fellas, I will just give you this, uh, this little nugget. There are only about three verses that deal with how the wife is to treat the husband in Ephesians 5. That's in verses 22, 23, and 24. But there's about seven verses that deal with how the husband's supposed to treat the wife. Because as much of a responsibility as what God places on the wife, he doubles your responsibility as the head of the home. You are to treat her like Jesus does the church. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Verse 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, so on and so forth. You say, how does Jesus treat us, preacher? <laughs> this, is, this is preaching ground right here. How does Jesus treat us? He loves us when we're unlovable. He has mercy on us, and he has grace on us. Now, I'll tell you what else he does for us. He wrote a love letter to us. He did. He wrote little love nothings to us and told us about how much he loves us and how much he cares for us and how much he's done for us and how many benefits he's got. Praise God. You say, preacher, I want to love my wife like Jesus loves the church. Write her a love note every once in a while. I know people don't write notes anymore. Text her a love note. Text her a little out of the blue love note and just tell her, honey, you, 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 you everything. Amen. I love you. I'm telling you, I, I, I couldn't do without you. I mean, you're, you're, my, you're my love. You're my bride. Uh, I, I mean, just, just give her one of them big, long, flattering things. You say, what good would that do? I don't know. Don't it do you some good when you read in there how Jesus looks at you? Don't it bless you sometimes when you read in there and you see what Jesus says about you and you think, that ain't me. I don't deserve that. Yeah, but in his eyes, he just thinks you're the tops this evening. In his eyes, he just loves you to death literally this evening. <laughs> I found an old love letter that was written just for me. It told me how much I was loved so sweet and tenderly. With special care I read each line of God's love to me. It was written by a nail-scarred hand at Calvary. Oh, how this old love letter spoke to my heart and soul. I was captured by everyone word as I watched God's love unfold with special care he wrote it down for all eternity it was written by a nail scarred hand at Calvary you know what God you know what Jesus has a a real interesting way of doing he has a real interesting way of not just absolutely ousting you for what you really are because he loves you. You won't never hear my Savior talking bad about me. Even though he should, Brother Bill. But he don't. Why? He loves me. Sir, can I flip the script from what I said about the ladies? I don't want to hear you bad mouthing your wife. You the one chased her down and acted like you couldn't live without her. Amen. Look, like I say, let's say just serious issues that we need to talk about and things of that nature in private, that's fine. But this idea that you're going to get around different fellas and tell them, your wife's sorry about this and she didn't do that and she didn't cook for me the other day and she didn't have this cleaned up. Well, bless the Lord. Let me just say this. How many times have you failed Jesus? How many times have you let the Lord down and yet the Lord loves you anyways? Aren't you glad this morning that no many times have how many times you've let God down you walk back into church and you feel them loving arms wrap around you uh, that unconditional mercy kiss you and say I love you and I care for you how about try that with your wife sometime 
You know what I find about our wives, gentlemen, so many times they are the weaker vessel. When I deal with weaker vessel, I, I think many times it is dealing with emotionally. I think it's dealing with the heart and emotions and things of that nature. And there are times, there are times, brother, where your wife, she's going to work herself to the bone just to try and please you, but she's going to come up short and she's going to feel like she is a failure. You ought to throw your arms dead around that woman's neck and say, honey, I love you. Honey, thank you for everything that you do around here. I mean, you say, why? Because that's what Jesus does for you. Say, she don't deserve it. You want to talk about stuff we deserve when it comes to Jesus? (laughs) I don't deserve what he does for me. He's faithful to me. He doesn't tell everybody my secrets. It's just between me and him. That's how I'm supposed to treat my wife. And you say, preacher, why does the home, why do we have downfalls in the home? Because I think we don't understand our roles. Sister, you are to treat him like the church treats Jesus. And sir, you are to treat her like Jesus treats the church. Do you? I'm just curious this, this evening. I'm preaching to myself. I'm as, Brother Keith Haynes, I'm as convicted about this message of my own self as I am any message that I preach. Because I feel like I fall short in this area so many times. I told y'all when I started this series, I did not do this series for a long time because I did not feel like I was qualified to do it. But I felt like the Lord asked me to. And that's the only reason I'm doing it, not because I feel like I have some great wisdom or have arrived because I certainly have not but I'm trying my best we see not only uh, there is misunderstood roles let me say secondly and hurriedly I believe the reason the home's downfall is there's a mindset that's wrong mindset that's wrong we think wrong about things there are two mindsets that's wrong two mindsets that are wrong one is we have this mindset of this. Now, I I, I didn't want to get preemptive and say this in my first point, so I'll say this in my second point. I know what some of y'all are thinking. I can read your mind. I know what some of y'all are thinking. Brother John, this is what they was thinking. While I was talking about you treating that guy that you're living with like Jesus, here's what you was thinking. But preacher, he don't act nothing like Jesus. He very un Jesus like. <laughs> Ain't no Jesus nowhere around <laughs> in that guy. Jesus wouldn't say that. Jesus wouldn't do this. Jesus wouldn't treat me like that. Jesus ain't like. And I know what some of you fellas is thinking. But preacher, she don't act nothing like the chaste virgin that the church is supposed to be towards Christ. She ain't, she ain't doing right by me. She don't praise me. She don't lift me up. She don't serve me. Pre- preacher, she don't submit to me. She don't act nothing like the church. And so here's where our mindsets are wrong. Here's where our mindsets are wrong. We get this idea, so until he or until she starts acting like they're supposed to, then I'm not going to act like I'm supposed to. Now, y'all, that is a mindset that's wrong. This is a totally wrong mindset. This mindset says this, I'll only do right if they do right. What is that? Huh? You're only going to do right if somebody else does right first. No, you're to do right whether your spouse or anybody in this church does right. I like what Bob Jones Sr. said, old, old man Bob Jones, not junior or the third or all them guys that's done messed up down there now. Bob Jones Sr. said this. He said, do right if the stars fall. Do right. You do what you're supposed to do regardless of if they're doing what they're supposed to do. You say, why? God will bless you for it. Take your Bible. Go to 1 Peter with me. We covered some of this territory when I talked through uh, 1 Peter in our uh, Sunday school class. But go to 1 Peter in chapter 3 with me. Come to the right through Hebrews and James to 1 Peter chapter 3. And the Bible has a lot to say about what I'm talking about right now. This wrong mindset. This I'll only do right if they do right. So they're not acting like Jesus. So I'm not going to do my part in acting like the church. So they're not acting like the church. So I'm not going to do my part in acting like Jesus. This is fundamentally wrong. 
Because listen, y'all, there are gonna, if, if that's the mindset you take, you're going to constantly be at each other. Because there will be many days in your home where she ain't going to act like the church. And there's many days in your home where you ain't going to act like Jesus. So on those days, you pick up each other's inefficiencies. And you do what's right in spite of them not doing what's right. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, likewise, 1 Peter 3, 1, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Watch this, that if any obey not the word, this is a woman living with a man who is not acting like Jesus. I don't know if the man's saved or lost. But it, it says this is a man who's not obeying the word. That if any obey not the word, they may also without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. That, that word conversation is, a, it is, is lifestyle, not just words. Because look at verse 2. While they behold, something you can see, behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Y'all, here is the quintessential example of an individual who is living with a person that's not doing what they're supposed to do. But she keeps doing what she's supposed to do. And what happens? It tenderizes his heart to the point where he starts doing what he's supposed to do. I can't tell you how... I'm going to say something about the men here down later in this verse. Well, let me say this. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard from church of yesteryear Brother J.C., church of yesteryear, of how many women either had lost husbands or just like backslid husbands, and they'd be drunks, and they'd be mean, and they'd be rude, but that woman would just pray for them, go to church, love them, and then they finally get saved and start sitting on a church pew with them. Do y'all know we don't hear them kind of stories, hardly any anymore? Can I tell you exactly why we don't hear those stories anymore? Here's why we don't hear those stories. Because we've even been infected in the church to the place where we say this. Well, if he ain't doing what he ought to do, just leave him. Well, if she ain't doing what she's supposed to do, just leave her. We're missing out on seeing God use your testimony to change somebody's life. Because you just get to the place where you say... I'm going to just do what everybody else is doing. Bounce. There's just one problem with that. You're not called to do what everyone else is doing. Watch, there's a man here too. Watch the man. Look down at verse number 7. There's so much more that could be said about the husband and wife here, but we don't have time. Verse 7, 1 Peter 3, 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. As being heirs together of the grace of life. Watch it, watch it, that your prayers be not hindered, sir. Regardless if that woman's doing what she's supposed to do or not, if you are not dwelling with her according to knowledge, if you're not giving honor unto her as the weaker vessel, then that Bible said your prayers are being hindered. Did, did you get that? You're missing out on answered prayers because you ain't treating her like God told you to treat her. I don't know about you. I don't want to be praying in vain. Brother Josh, I don't want to be praying and just prayers hitting the roof and bouncing back down. Or the Lord Jesus sitting there saying, yeah, I heard it, but I ain't listening to it. I ain't doing nothing because you ain't treating that woman like Jesus treats the church. I don't want my prayers hindered. So we see there's a mindset that's wrong. It's this mindset of I'll do right if they do right. Can I say there's one more mindset that's wrong? The other mindset that's wrong is it's a mindset we've picked up from the world. A mindset to where everything I'm preaching tonight, everything I'm preaching tonight, this mindset that everything I'm preaching tonight is laughed at, mocked, scoffed, and this is absolutely insane, preacher. You are living in the past. Yeah, absolutely. I'm living in the Bible. You are, you, are, you, are, you are living in a different day. I don't care what day we're living in. We've not been commanded to change just because the year has changed on the calendar. 
And I couldn't care less what Vogue says, People Magazine says, what the colleges or the universities say, or what mainstream media says. I dead sure couldn't care less what Oprah Winfrey or The View or none of the rest of them say. I don't care. They don't win place or show in my marriage. Sister, stop listening to some of these voices that pump junk into your mind that start making you think that, you know, you, 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 you need to just, you know, spread your wings and fly and all this. And sir, stop listening to this garbage where it's got this idea that you could do better and you you need to start getting on the prowl. Look, stop listening to this stuff. Get back to the Bible. Get back to the Bible. There's a reason. There's a reason why it is. It's, it's hilarious to me, brother David Fields. It's hilarious to me that the world sets themselves up like an authority on the home, and they're anything but. Brother Danny, they're anything but. Look at the average home of the world, i.e., Hollywood or politics. Y'all know what they all are? They're all a bunch of whoremongers and harlots. They get married for like uh, six months, and they bounce from that one, and they got another one. And they're married for another six months, and they bounce from that, and they get another one. And brothers, it's a mess. Why? Because they're not doing things the Bible way. Because the Bible way is just, it's outdated. That's, we, you know, I'd be afraid what they'd say about me. You better get over that. So we see there's a mindset that's wrong. Have you noticed how unbiblical every TV show is on the home? Every without fail television show or streaming service show, it doesn't matter which it is, whether it's on CBS, NBC, ABC, Fox, or whether it's on Netflix or Prime or Hulu or whatever, every one of them have a warped perspective on the home. All of them. And if there is a family that they hold up, as a prominent example on the home and they go by the Bible pattern, then they are mocked and laughed at and looked at like they're stupid. There's not one, there's not one solid male figure that leads his home on mainstream television. Not one. Men are either made to be effeminate or they're made, or they're just totally written out of the script and they're not even there. Or they're made to look like bumbling, stupid ignoramuses. Y'all, we've got to get this mindset changed. We've got to get our mindset filtered back through what saith the scripture. If our homes are to make it. All right, I'm done. The mindset that's wrong. Downfall of the home. We see the mindset that's wrong. Misunderstood roles. And lastly, we see there's a mystery to be recognized. A mystery to be recognized. Look at what Paul finally gets to the place where he says, verse 31 and 32. 31 and 32. 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Watch what he says about this marriage thing. This is a great mystery. I know he says, but I speak concerning Christ and the church, but part of the mystery is just marriage itself. Y'all know what a mystery is? I looked up the word in the text, mystery, and it literally means this. A mystery is a secret or a hidden thing. Now, I'm done here. I want you to hear this. Preacher, how can my marriage survive this war that's going on in our world? And How, how can it survive? You ready for this? Solve the mystery. Solve the mystery. You say, what are you talking about? Solve the well, the Bible said marriage, this idea of two becoming one and living together and trying to raise a family for God and, and be what they should be, and the wife act like the church and the husband act like Christ. It's a mystery. How do we make it? Figure this out. Don't try and just figure it out on your own, sister. Don't try and just figure it out on your own, brother. Both of y'all together better get together and start figuring out how to solve this thing. So you know what it is that makes her tick and you know what it is that makes him tick and then both of you together are submitting yourself to the word of God and the will of God. Solve the mystery. Most of all, get God involved in the middle of all of it. The mystery of living with a man. The mystery of living with a woman. <laughs> this should have been on unsolved mysteries. Unsolved mysteries. 
a man came to the Lord one day and he said, Lord, I'd sure like it if you would answer a prayer request. I got some uh, desire. And the Lord said, you've done such a good job for me and you've lived for me for so long. He said, I will I'll answer you. What do you want? Just name it. Name it. Claim it. I'll give it to you. He said, well, he said, all my life I've wanted to go to Hawaii. He said, but I'm scared to death to fly and I'm scared of boats. He said, what I'd like for you is to build me a road from Los Angeles to Hawaii. And the Lord said, that's the dumbest request I ever heard. That's impossible. You can't build a road from the west coast to Hawaii. No road that long. Water's too deep. It can't be done. Ask me for something else. And the man said, okay, I've been married for a long time. I would like a book on what my wife's thinking and how to make my wife happy. And the Lord looked at him and said, uh, sir, would you like that in two lane or four lane? <laughs> I'm simply saying marriage is a mystery. Yes, it is. But you want to know something? I'll tell you this. Some of, the, some of the coolest movies that you'll ever watch are those movies, Brother Bill, that leave you guessing, figuring stuff out. I pride myself, Brother Jack, on when we watch movies like that with my family, I'm already calling out what's going to happen at the end. And when it happens, I say, told you. My wife says, shut up, shut up, shut up. Told you it was going to happen like that. We love that stuff. Watch them mysteries, murder mystery, or who done it, or murder she wrote, and all that kind of stuff. Y'all, listen to me. There ain't no more fun or mystery, and that ain't good English, but this is good theology. There is no fun or mystery to solve than the both of you solving the mystery of marriage together. You know what's awesome about marriage? This is what's awesome about it. We've been married 18 years, and there are times she'll say something, and I'll say, I didn't know that about you. <laughs> 18 years. I bet you talk to some people here been married 40 and 50 years and they're still having that happen. Solve the mystery together. It's a whole lot of fun. Amen. Don't let your home hit the bottom. Esther, help me over here. Don't let your home hit the bottom. Don't let it downfall. Understand your roles together. Sister, I want to deny. Let's just, let's just get right down to where we're at and let's just cut all the rest of it away and all blow away the smoke. Let's look at the fire. Sister, are you personally treating your husband like the church treats Jesus? Sir, are you personally treating your wife like Jesus treats the church? Now, if in your heart you say, I need to work on that, there's an altar down here. You can join me at it. Why don't we pray and say, Lord, help us. Help me to do what I'm supposed to do so that my home is everything it should be. Lord, help us to understand our roles, get our mindset corrected, and solve the mystery of marriage together. And watch God bless your home. Let's all stand tonight. Father, I pray you'd bless this simple message from the Word of God. Thank you for the truth entailed therein. You should be a blessing in our homes. Help our husbands. Help our wives. God, we'll thank you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen.